Hi. Today I'm talking about five big differences between I'm hearing some weird stuff through my audio. Oh my goodness, it's freaking me out. Hold on just a second. Oh, I see what's happening. Okay, scratch that. Let's start over. It's two o'clock. Uh, we're just getting started. This is Craft Leftovers Live. And I've th totally thrown my intro that I actually practiced right out the window. So let's just hit that like reset. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the audio is fixed now. Um, okay, starting over. Hello. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about five big differences between brick and click retail. So you may or may not know, but I own Little Woods Herbal, which is a physical retail business. But I've also, since I was about, I don't know, 22-ish, uh, done e-commerce. And I'm going way long-winded because that's just what you do when you're live. You get a little off script. Anyway, so today I really wanted to talk about those five core differences and where I've really struggled because there is a big difference in your and we'll just, we'll get to it. So this is Craft Leftovers Live. I'm Kristen M. Roach. I'm the owner of Little Woods Herbal, creator of Craft Leftovers, and author of Mend It Better. And we're just going to roll right into it. Oh yeah, so first, if you're tuning in right now, who are you? Where are you from? What's your creative business? And do you have any questions for me today related to uh, creative business questions. I'm looking at my monitor and it looks like I'm maxing out my mic. I can never get my audio right. It kills me every time. Anyway, so I would love it if you posted a link to your creative biz in the comments so that way other people can find you and I would love to just get to know you better. So please do that. Then second, mending. Okay, so every time I do this live, I also kind of do something to keep my hands busy. We're gonna try something a little bit different today. Um, I'm actually just gonna really focus on the stuff that I wanna tell you that I actually, that I prepared, <laughs> go me, uh, for you. So that way in case you do need to, you know, you're just stopping by and you need to pop over to something else that I can get you this like really core information right away. Um, so to keep my hands busy today though, because I love mending and that's kind of what I'm here for, but it's also for other stuff. I don't know. It's, it's like a way I can sit down and mend every single month. So we have today this simple but wonderful baby blanket. Lucy loves this little guy and went before she could even really speak well, she used to call it her Oki blanket because she couldn't really say monkey, but it's got these cute little monkeys on it. And it's got a bunch of tears and holes in it. Just over time, it's getting to that point where it's finally running thin. And relative to other ways I've mended things, this time I'm actually using an embroidery hoop. So there's lots of different ways you can darn, but because this is a really flat thing, unlike a sock, I'm gonna use an embroidery hoop. Anyway, so that's kind of like my housekeeping. Post who you are in the comments, where you're from, what your creative business is. If you have any questions, don't forget to subscribe and like so you catch future live streams. And then also what I'm mending. What are you mending? Are you working on something right now? Let me know. Anyway, okay. So like I said, I've prepared some things this time. I love this topic. And as I was preparing for this, I was like, oh my gosh, this isn't just like one live stream. This could be the whole series for the rest of the year. It's like, what is the difference between brick and click? And what happens when you have both? And how does that change your business and your messaging and your marketing and your product and the way you're interacting with your community and all that kind of jazz? And quite frankly, I don't have it figured out. And so many of the things that I'm talking about today are kind of like where I'm struggling. Um, so yeah, so number one, and these are not in order <laughs> of importance, and maybe it actually is opposite. So number one is merchandising versus online listings. So when you go into a re physical retail space, it's, 
it's design, it's interior design. And there's a lot of psychology around how you place things, the flow of the store, that's very different than how you would structure an online store. So in a physical space with merchandising, it's like how you're placing the merchandise, your literal merchandise placement. And in your online store, you do have this too. You have your listings, you've got your landing pages, your homepage, you have how your menu is organized, that nice little hamburger at the top. And there are lots of theories about this. And a lot of it is dependent on your particular product, your brand, the community you're serving, and also um, uh, industry, kind of industry standards. So like how I arrange Littlewood's Herbal's menu online is very different than how we approach it in store and also how I approach craft leftovers or craft leftovers versus my portfolio. And what's interesting is this last month, I actually did my, I wanna say it's the fourth open studio in my space on Main Street. And, um, and so it's like pop-up craft leftover shop, the Roach Motel Zine Distro, and in uh, my art, like prints, greeting cards, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it, it was so fun. But quite frankly, this space is terribly merchandised. It's hilarious. Not only is just like the entryway incredibly intimidating to come upstairs because it's like dark and there's a luminescent art in there, which is super cool. But you almost have to kind of be a very brave soul to make it upstairs. And then you're like, you're not in a retail space, you're in our offices. So it's very non-traditional, super fun, quite the adventure, <laughs> but not like a good retail situation. So I didn't sell a lot of work, which I didn't think I was really going to because that wasn't really the point of it. Anyway, so then online, you've got your online listings and and the way that you present your online listings is going to be different than how you're like merchandising things in the store, which I feel like is pretty obvious. But those are kind of just two differences where it's like in store, you really need to focus on your merchandising online. You really got to focus on your listings, good quality images um, that are really highlighting that singular item. And so something that I struggle with merchandising is that like. I forget to price items because like I've got them. And so I just like set them out and they're not priced. And that's also really terrible. Like it makes it feel ambiguous. Is this even for sale? Cause a lot of times they're kind of like artfully arranged and clustered. It's like, is this just for display? Is this for sale? I don't know. I, people inflate prices a lot. So like they look at something and they might think, oh my gosh, this is probably like a $40 teapot. And it's like, or like mug and it's like $25 or, you know, something like that. Um, where online, your merchandising in, in a way is almost like the contextual placement of your products with like social media marketing, lifestyle photos, like how kind of helping people to envision how they would use it in their own space. And, but I find in both, and this is the similarity, is that if you have too much visual clutter in your product listing, like in your photo, or in your merchandising, it creates a sense of ambiguity around what's actually for sale and doesn't leave space open for someone to imagine it in their own home. And you have to have a clear call to action. Like don't leave that um, add to cart button too small, too low. Honestly, on Little Woods, we had a little bit of a bug with our design. And so now the cart button's probably a little too big. But also like in store, make it really clear where people can check out what the price is, all those kinds of things, and make it so they can have access to informa more information about the product. And one thing with online listings too, is you can really use those related products to kind of upsell. But so 
yeah, where I've struggled is that pricing, like, I just forget. So I've gotten better over the years, but it's still a struggle from time to time. And, and then finding that balance between keeping things looking full. So like the, the shop looks like healthy and vibrant and stocked and like kind of ready to go without looking cluttered. And I struggle with that online too, is like keeping things from being cluttered, too much product, too much information. So it kind of gets overwhelming. Um, and so that's something I'm still working on. And signage is a really big one in store that I really struggle with. So like kind of along the lines of pricing, you know, there's a lot of signage we could really add to our little wood space as well as to my new kind of like open studio space. And, um, for instance, what I mentioned about make the entryway being intimidating to come into Jason's like, why don't you have a sign that says like in the stairwell this way with an arrow to make it, feel like when you open the door, like, oh, okay, I'm allowed, I'm being invited up. And I, and after I did that, more people came up. So signage is super key in that retail physical space to direct people like where they're supposed to go, what the expectation is, how to check out, or just to provide more information. Um, okay, and I'm super excited. Hey, Deb Corey, how are you doing? <laughs> So Deb mentioned in the comments that she just mended a vintage gown made of taffia. Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. She just needs to put her seams together. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Deb. Um, okay, so then thing number two that's like super different between retail and, and this kind of goes with the last one, so retail in person versus online. So like online you have your landing pages, you have your home page, and you have your about and contact pages, right? And with those, you want to get people, you want to invite them in, essentially. You wanna grab their attention, you wanna give them an expectation for what to expect once they dig deeper into your store. So like, things like what the current sale is, what your, Give them an idea of what you're selling. Um, I've definitely been to websites, <laughs> including my own, <laughs> where you go to the homepage and you're like, what is even going on here? What is this about? You know, what's the expectation? And it kind of, that again, that ambigu ambiguity uh, just makes it really hard to commit to a brand. It doesn't give you a sense of assurance that this company is legit, especially online. Consumer confidence is so vital because they're entrusting you with their credit card information in particular. There's a lot of concern about identity theft and people feel a little vulnerable. So you need to make them feel, feel secure, not just that your product is of quality and wonderful, but also that like your website is secure, that they're not gonna get their information stolen from you, that you are worthy of their trust. And that is super hard. So that homepage, you definitely have to make an impression that like, I am professional, I'm a legitimate business, I know what's up, I'm gonna take care of you. <laughs> but then also give them an idea of like, this is what I'm selling, this is what you'll find here. Um, so like on Littlewood's website, we put right on that front, like that above the fold section, we put like bulk herbs, tea blends, spice blends, you know, like shop A to Z, sale. You get a real sense of like, we are a botanical company. We sell tea, we sell spices. Hopefully you get the sense we make our own stuff. But even just this last week, one of the feedback we had is wonderful customer came all the way from Cedar Rapids, which is a pretty good drive over an hour to come visit our shop. And she was like, wow, you guys are so different than what I thought you were when I found you online. I had this very different impression of you. You're so much better, <laughs> which good, right? Cause we were good enough online that she actually wanted to visit us. But that's really interesting that like 
And it made me think that maybe our online presence isn't quite mirroring our, our actual company. A lot of people think that we are a lot bigger than we are. A lot of people think that we're actually a franchise when they find us all, like when they come into our physical shop or when they find us online, they think that we're as big as say, like, you know, Mountain Rose or whatever, which is not true. Like we are a small mom and pop shop. We have like four or five employees. Only one of them is full time. It's, I mean, it's a lot of me and Jason and, and our, and our one time full-time employees supplemented by the rest of our team. But like, we're a very small company. And so we bring a lot of that like mom and pop, small, very um, one-on-one customer interaction to our online store. Like if you send a contact through the, or send a message to the contact page, you're gonna be, oops, I just smacked my microphone. You're gonna be talking with me. Like I'm personally gonna read that message and. Re- and most likely it's either going to be me or our manager who's going to reply directly to you to solve your problem. And just like if you're coming to the store, like we want to make sure we're taking care of you and that you're having a good experience, even if it's online and you live three states away or whatever. So anyway, consumer trust via the home page, landing page. Oddly enough, the about and contact pages are usually the second or third place people look to kind of try to figure out like, is this, does this place really exist or is this a scam? So it's really good. You give that good impression. Now here is where it's different and similar physically, especially on a street like main street where you're getting a lot of walk-in traffic. It is your front window display and your outside signage. That is like your homepage and your landing page. And this is, I did great with our outdoor signage. (laughs) I had to like toot my own horn. And, but it's good. It's like Little Woods, herbs, and tea. And then like along the bottom, it says like, you know, gifts, spices, apothecary, blah, 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 et cetera, tea bar. Um, But I really struggle with the window display which is kind of like merchandising, but it's different because you're not trying to get someone to buy something in the window. What you're trying to do is entice them to come inside and check you out and to set the expectation of what they're going to find when they get inside. And that's, that's different, you know, and it's a different approach. It takes a different skill set. It's, I am glad that I am a creative artist type because honestly, that is the same brain that allows me to do exhibits and made me a great curator and installation artist. It's the same brain that makes me amazing at doing a window display when I have time. (laughs) And that is the big thing is you've got to make time for it. And I know it's super important, but this is another area where I really struggle is finding the time to change out the front window. And I got to give a huge shout out to my neighbors across the street, Dog Eared Books. They change out their window display. I want to say it's maybe once a month, once every two months. And it is amazing. They are fun and engaging. And it really gives you a sense of who they are as a company. Sometimes books are, I mean, they always feature books because they're a bookstore. But like right now, they have like four or five tire swings in their front window and it's just awesome. I really strive to do a better job like they do and I recently went out and sourced a bunch of stuff to do like a picnic, 4th of July, summer tea kind of theme. So we'll see if I can pull it off. I'll post a picture on craft leftovers over on Instagram if (laughs) if I get it together. (laughs) So that's just like another area where it's like It's kind of a similar thing. You're trying to draw people in. You're trying to set the expectation for what they're going to find. But it's also a bit different in that it takes a different kind of skill set. It's less graphic design and more installation art, which I love. I love both of those. So I guess as long as I have time, it works out great for me. Let's see. I made some, some notes. So let me make sure I didn't forget anything on that part. 
Um, do, 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 do. I think a big point about the homepage that I didn't mention was like on a website, when they're coming to your homepage or the landing page, you want to make sure they can find what they're looking for. And so again, that kind of goes back to like making sure there's a search field right away, making sure there's a newsletter sign up, making sure that they can see easily how to get where they're going. And that's like one of the reasons why we actually put the T Passport both as a featured item right on the front, as well as like up on the top menu bar, because usually like we do a lot of promotion for the T Passport or like in the store, we'll even say like, oh, you can sign up for this online. It's really simple, yada, yada. And so if they go to our website, we want them to really easily be able to find that. Okay. Oof. This next one, number three, it's a big one. Staffing. Wow. Over the last six years, that has been the hardest part of having a physical shop. Now you may get to the point where you have your e-commerce store and you need to staff it, right? Like I totally hit that with Littlewoods and that's part of what start us on the train of opening the brick and mortar. But it's like until you're hitting that point where you have more orders than you can fill and say like, a, you know, four hours a day kind of thing which if you're spending over four hours a day packing orders, you know, the other four hours is probably focused on actually like marketing and running your business, updating listings and all that kind of jazz. You know, you might start looking at hiring someone, but even then like you're, you're only open when there's orders to pack, if that makes sense. So like you're only, you're not having to like maintain open hours. You're just open all the time and there's no work to be done for like an employee unless there's orders to pack. And like if there's orders to pack, that means you're bringing in more income. So great, right? That's the goal anyway, As, especially when you're like in that solopreneur, just getting your first employee kind of place. Now with a brick and mortar store, Anytime you want to make money, your doors physically have to be unlocked and open and someone has to physically be there. And that is, that's really hard. And it's really hard to know how to staff that. And like with Littlewoods, one of the issues we found is we really have to have two people at all times. Because if we have someone wanting a tea latte and someone wanting some great like loose leaf tea or spices to take home with them, it's really hard, like, it hurts customer satisfaction if we can't just help them both and get them both out of here as quickly as possible. There's a lot of contact time per, per customer. And so like online, you put in a lot of upfront labor building your web store. But in the physical shop, there's a lot of downtime. There's a lot of like, no one's coming in. You know, Main Street is wonderful for walk-in traffic, but quite frankly, our shop location is on the end of Main Street, and we don't get nearly as much walk-in traffic as the rest of downtown does, which is fine. It works great for us, and honestly, because of the nature of our business, it's okay. Because we're the kind of business where, like, we're a bit, like I said, someone drove an hour and a half to come see us. Like, there's not that many artisan spice tea apothecary type places in Iowa. There's a few, there's a few apothecaries, there's a few tea shops, but to have them combined together, that's pretty rare. And it's pretty, it's, it's special, right? I'd be willing to drive to go see that on a weekend trip. And so we physically have to be there and there's gotta be like two of us. And that's hard, like that's a lot of upfront cost, but here is the plus. It's easier to maintain a work-life balance because you have natural downtime where you can be doing other things. So maybe I'm scheduled 25 to 40 hours a week. 
whatever it might be on the given week, given my other workloads. Like today I'm here, I'm not at the shop, <laughs> obviously. But so here's the thing is like, it's real easy. Okay. Hold on. Okay. So when you have an e-commerce website, it's really alluring to always be open in the sense of like, you're always working on it, trying to make it better, like always. And there's not really a structured work day. And you can do this when you have a brick and mortar shop, of course, because you're passionate about it. You love it. You want to make it its best possible self because it's almost like a part of yourself. Like you wouldn't have done this. You wouldn't have opened a business if you weren't passionate about it. So like, here's the thing though, you can leave. <laughs> and you literally, there's this finality. There's this mental shift of like, I am leaving work. I am going home. I am now home. And there's a barrier to get back into work. And a lot of things you just can't do from home. I can't merchandise the store and work on the window display or blend tea unless I'm physically at work. And so there's, it's like easier to have a bit of that separation. And because there's all this built in downtime, we can get a lot of other stuff done between customers when there aren't customers in the shop. And you start to get a sense of this like natural ebb and flow of like, you know, earlier today was really slow, but we got some online orders and we're also making scones for the week. <laughs> so like, it's perfect. Now, the other interesting thing is you can really fall into the trap of I'll just staff it myself and I'll save the company money. And that that's, that's hard. And I see a lot, I've done this. I am tempted to do this often where it's like, Oh, I'll just work the hours myself. We're a little, you know, May is like one of the slowest months of the year. And we also have to buy like the entire tea harvest for the year that we need for blending and everything. So, you know, to like help cash flow, like people are going on vacation. I'll just work their hours myself and I just won't pay myself. Right. Which is both a privilege and curse of ownership. And that is a hard trap. It's an easy trap to get into and it's a hard trap to get out of. And so one of the ways that I actually avoid doing that for Jason and I is, you know, we kind of get a small, really small salary. It works out to about, I don't know, $10 an hour. So nothing crazy. And it's for about, we work anywhere between 20 and 30 hours a week. Um, like at Little Woods. If we work over that covering shifts for people who are out of town or like the shop is slammed or there's a special event, I actually pay us like over, I pay us additional wages. And, and then that also helps where if I start having to do that often enough, I know there's money in the budget to hire somebody. So if my hours keep creeping up and I'm like, hitting 40, 50, even 60 hours, especially at that 60 hours point, but I've been consistently paying myself. And I actually pay myself like a higher wage rate because it kind of factors in taxes, payroll expenses, etc. If I start consistently doing that because the shop needs it, then it's like built into the budget that I can hire someone and work less and pass that like kind of budget allotment off to somebody else. But in the meantime, it's a really nice bonus for all my extra hard work. So that's something like, I think it was Eric Abrams over at Duckworth Waring in the loft, which is downtown, who kind of clued me into like, it's really important to pay yourself both for like budgetary reasons, but also morale. Like you should be rewarded for working so hard on your business. Um, and then 
let's see. Kind of along those same lines, you might not be your highest paid employee. You know, that might be a thing. And you might not work the most hours. And that's okay. Like, that's something that I've really struggled with because I feel like if the shop is open, I need to be there and I feel guilty if I'm not. Like right now I'm doing this, I'm working, I'm working on my business even, but it's not my like main primary income business. And I don't really have employees for craft leftovers. I have a studio assistant who helps me with stuff from time to time, but like at Littlewoods, I have a full staff and I feel really bad if they're like, they're working hard and I'm over here talking to you all about craft doing a YouTube live stream. Like I feel a little guilt about that. And that's been a challenge for me to balance that like, honestly, I pay our shop manager more than I pay myself. And she also works more hours than I do. And, but she's worth it, right? Like she's totally worth it. Cause right now she is at the shop and she's there Monday through Friday, 9.30 to five, you know, most days of the, most of the time. And sure, I cover for her when she's gone, but she also makes it so I can pursue these other, these other companies. And that's kind of like a big goal of mine is to be able to, it's not that I, I want to like make it so I don't work at Little Woods because I love it. Um, and I do a lot of like the administrative oversight, creative direction, marketing, product development, merchandising, that kind of thing. But I found that with my personality, I'm not necessarily the best person to be like behind the T-bar every single day. And, and yeah, so that's, that's been an interesting thing is like, you know, when you have an e-commerce store, especially when you're a solopreneur, any profit is your income. We're like at Little Woods. Uh, any profit is not necessarily for me. Um, and so that's just kind of like an interesting, another weird staffing thing that kind of happens. And I've noticed that a lot too, like as I've been trying to kind of better myself as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, as a creative person, um, kind of in this field, I feel like a lot of this stuff coming out about marketing, about entrepreneurship, about like working from home is all very service-based. It's all like life coach, uh, you know, e-course. There's a lot less for people running retail, like retail businesses where you're dealing with the public in this very physical way in person. It's not just like you're doing a special live in-person event. It's like, you're live and in person every day. And it seems like there's a lot less information about what that's like out there. Anyway, so that's, that's just kind of a curious thing. Anyway, so, okay. Number four. So number four is your actual customers, like your customer demographics. And this is always changing. So I'm going to use some generalities and I know that they are not necessarily true. I know that a lot of these are actually they're going to be like, well, I shop online and that doesn't fit me. But for our, like our company, especially this is referring particularly to Little Woods, which um, I feel like I've probably at this point invested the most like time and energy to. Um, our online customers are very different than our local customers. So like locally, a lot of times we'll capture just about anybody who's walking by and they will surprise you. It's everybody from like the, oh, there's just one customer. He came in and I hate to admit this, but it also like really was a good reality check for me of like, oh, you've got some preconceptions going on that are not, that you just need to toss out the window. So this guy came in, Harley dude, big beard, tough, motorcycle guy. He totally bought a ton of tea and just like tucked it into his jacket. And he's like, oh yeah, I love tea every day. And it was awesome. Cause I'm like thinking, oh, he must want to be going next door to the bar. 
right? No, no, he was totally in the right place. I just had, I had some preconceptions. Like I said, I just need to toss out the window. Another one was like this guy who uh, totally just came in from like working the fields, like stereotypical Iowa farmer guy. Apparently he's been to China. He loves tea. He's into herbalism. Super amazing person. And again, it was like, okay, I need to toss my preconceptions out the window. So like when you're working locally, a lot of times, sure, you're going to have certain segments of your community that are going to be more into what you're selling. Like we find, you know, women age 35 to about 50 of a certain income bracket with a certain level of like university, um, you know, usually if they've got like a master's or more, they're more apt to to seek us out and find us. And that's like the majority of our local customer demographic. But we serve the whole community. And so we just chuck those preconceptions out the window. And while we may market to those, that kind of like key demographic, everybody who walks in is our neighbor, you know, like Ames is a small place. So like you just, you serve your neighbor tea. That's what you do. So you know, it's, and the other thing, so that's kind of like personality. Now online, we find our customers tend to skew a little younger. They tend to be more like 25 to 40. They tend to be both men and women. And, um, and there's some key differences in their shopping trends. Now, as far as like what they're into, the interesting thing is, is most of them have traveled internationally. Most of them are into herbalism. Um, and honestly, they're not buying our blends as much as in store. So like in store, I would say like 70 to 80% of our business is actually our bulk tea. Online, it's very different. It's a lot more about the bulk individual ingredients. And so I can't remember if this is, okay, yeah. So in store, you can physically offer people something to drink. You can say like, try this tea. You can make recommendations based on their immediate in-person feedback. It's a wonderful way to help them have the best experience possible. Online, you can only offer them samples after they've ordered, after they've already committed. And the only way that you can really make recommendations is through things like product bundling and related project products or like your social media kind of like lifestyle photos of like putting things together, gift sets, stuff like that. And so it's a lot harder to like make those very personalized recommendations. Um, and then people who are coming in store, quite frankly, they tend to be in more of a rush. And I don't just mean like, I don't mean they're impatient. I mean, like, they need something that day. Like, they're on their way to a baby shower. You know, like, that kind of thing. They're on their way out of town to go to their their parents' house and they want to bring their mom her favorite tea. Um, or they're just, like, out and about and they want a hot cup of tea right here and now. And so there's, like, that more immediate need. They're willing to pay a little bit more for that, for that instant gratification. And granted, there's a higher cost with retail business. So like that little extra price is is warranted, right? It's why you pay more for a brewed hot tea in a store than you would if you just took it home and brewed it. Because you want it right now. You want to enjoy it right now. <laughs> and it's like that same kind of thing. So like in-store sales, they tend to be a little bit more of a, a rush and it's more of that personalized shopping experience. Now online, they tend to be looking for a deal. They're not just looking at your store. They literally, through different tabs, they can be looking at like five different herb shops or tea shops online and figuring out like, oh, so the English breakfast is this price here, but I really like this blend here and they don't have anything comparable on that website but the rose hips are a great price, but this other thing is way more expensive. What's the free shipping? 
all that kind of thing. So they tend to be a little bit more cerebral about their shopping. It's not even that they're like bargain hunters, but they're really on a search for something very special, a good price, good quality that they can't find locally. And so that's like another really big thing about it is that they're willing to wait a bit longer for it to come in. And especially since the pandemic, I feel like people are more understanding of shipping delays due to supply shortage or just like shipping shortages or staffing shortages in general. And so like your online customers, they tend to be willing to wait a little longer. Although in a, in a lot of ways, that's less the case because of current trends with like next day shipping um, through places like Amazon Marketplace and stuff like that. And that's really hurt small retailers like us just simply for the fact that there's no way we can keep up with that. We just don't have the, um, oh, what is it called? The logistics network that a place like Amazon can have. I mean, it's literally me coming into the shop, seeing I got an order, packing it up as quickly as I can between customers and getting it out the door to you. You know, like it's just a different it's a different workflow. And um, so that's been kind of interesting, but I feel like most people who are coming to our store, they understand we're a small business and they're a little bit willing, they're willing to wait for it um, within reason. And you should always feel free to email and be like, where's my order? And we will figure it out for you. <laughs> Every once in a while, one falls through the cracks. It can't be denied. Anyway, so I think that's kind of like the big thing between in-person versus online customers. Okay, now here is number five. I can't believe I've already talked about this for like 40 minutes straight, oh my gosh. It's a good thing I didn't focus on my mending because we'd be like here all day. Um, am I even gonna take a stitch this time? I don't know, that's okay, it's worth it. I really wanna share this with you because I feel like these are a lot of things maybe you're wondering about. If you're thinking about branching out into a brick and mortar store or if you're thinking about taking your brick and mortar store online, now, number five is so important in both. It's community. I am not kidding. I know that sounds crazy because it feels like if you have a brick and mortar store, you just plunk down your store and there you are. Well, guess what? There you are next to all your neighbors. Whether you're in a shopping mall, a strip mall, a standalone store, or like me, you're on like a main street, You've got neighbors and it is interesting <laughs> and awesome. Like it, it's crazy. So, but online, you also may think you're just plopping your store online, hanging out your shingle at like, you know, dot com, whatever. That is not true. You are also part of a community online. Your community is not just your customers either. It's the other people in your industry and it's other and it's other brands you can partner with. So online, your community is based on industry partners. And that means like, you know, so for instance, craft leftovers. My, my very obvious industry partners right now are my contributors to Mend It Better who I've been doing interviews with it's people who repost my blog posts and patterns. So places like allfreeknitting.com or whatever. Um, it's places like Story Publishing, who's the publisher for Mend It Better. And so like anytime I talk about Mend It Better, I'm hitting up Story Publishing. I'm like tagging them. I'm saying like, hey, I'm talking about you. You know, return the favor, right? And there's co-branding. There's also cross-promoting, so like writing reviews for other people's products and in return them doing the same for you or some other kind of form of cross-promotion. Back in the day there was lots of like blog tours and that kind of thing where you do a series of blog, like when my book came out we did one of those where it's like a series of blog posts about the book across a whole ring of people and you kind of like cross-promote everybody else's stuff. Um, things like guest posts and social media mentions, you know, so those are all kind of like parts of your community. There's also like your newsletter is really vital on um, making that more like personal connection with 
people who are into what you're doing. Um, in person is a little different. It's kind of all those things that I just mentioned, but it's also your physical neighbors <laughs> and like literally unlocking your door. I'm bringing out my patio furniture for our like outdoor cafe and my neighbor is unlocking his door and like sweeping a stoop and we're having a chat about such and such that's happening downtown and, um, and, and you know, like all that kind of good stuff. And you're going out, you're running into people at lunch physically, like that would, that's always so fun. You know, like I'll go down to cornbread for lunch and I'll see somebody from another business down the block having their lunch break and it's just a really fun time to connect and get to know each other. And so it's this really supportive community. There's also things like local business associations. So like here in Ames, we have Ames Main Street. Uh, we have the Chamber of Commerce. And we've got a lot of other like kind of smaller nucleus groups that kind of form. And, and those are great. And it's a wonderful way to learn from each other. That's actually how I met the guy I mentioned earlier, Eric Abrams from... Duckworth wearing, which I'll totally link to him in the show notes. Um, because like he was the president of Ames Main Street and I was the vice president, you know? And so we had all these board meetings together and got to know him and his business is much further along than mine is. And I asked him if he would like come give me some advice if he was okay with that. And thankfully he was like amazing mentor wonderful, generous guy, uh, very good business sense. Pro, pro tip, make more money. <laughs> like, actually, it kind of reminds me, oh my gosh, okay, I feel like this is a thing where I'm just going to mention Crispina French, like every live stream from henceforth. It really struck me what she said, and it's been kind of ringing in my ears um, of like, a basic core fundamental of business is like, make more money than you spend. And it doesn't matter if you're making $100 or $100,000, you got to make more money than you spend. And anyway, so thinking of Eric Abrams, like one of his, okay, side note, what the conversation really was is we were looking at my budget and I was like, how do I make this work? I feel like I'm really close to like getting to the point where this is all going to work. And he's like, well, you can either cut payroll or you can make more money. Or you can work the hours yourself and don't pay yourself. And he's like, I would recommend you make more money. <laughs> I was like, too true. Thank you. So I've been working on it. It's hard. It's, it's easy and it's hard. It's one of those funny things. So then there's also like wholesale opportunities. And you can do this online. Like I actually i am super excited about this. Uh, I just got Littlewoods on Fair and Juniper Market. And we're going to start doing wholesale. Uh, I'll link to those in the show, show notes once the shops are live. If you have an indie boutique that you'd want to sell my tea in, just saying, you know. Uh, and anyway, so that you do have uh, like wholesale online opportunities, but it's a bit different because like my approach to like fair and juniper market is very much about uh, kind of what Eric Capram said. It's about making more money, right? Like I'm really looking to those clients as a, an additional income stream. Locally, my wholesale clients, it's not really about making money. And in fact, some products um, we wouldn't normally wholesale because our markup isn't awesome. And we don't really make that much from them when we sell them to local businesses. And we do things like we don't charge a minimum to local businesses because for us, it's more really about brand awareness. I know you could think, how could I live in Ames, Iowa, a town of only 60,000 people and not know that there's a tea store? It is shockingly common. We've been here for six years. <laughs> and people still come in and I'm like, there's a tea shop in Ames. Are you guys new? And I'm like, oh, no, not really. We've been here for six years. And they're like, I've lived in Ames for three years. I had no idea. I love tea. You know, and then they become like our biggest fans, which is amazing to see that conversion. But I'm like, how do we get them sooner? And so getting your tea into other locations around town where you might catch their eye, 
uh, definitely helps. So things like we don't have any plans of selling our tea nationally in grocery stores like Hy-Vee and Fairway and that kind of thing. But locally, like physically in Ames, I'm working really hard to get our tea into those grocery stores because that's where local people go. Everybody goes grocery shopping. <laughs> so like, you know, or like partnering with local restaurants. Uh, we have our tea in several local restaurants. Uh, Dog Ear Books that I mentioned earlier, Morning Bell Coffee Roasters, Cafe Milo, they all sell our tea. Um, so just, it's like a different, the reasoning behind it is different. So like the reason I'm doing wholesale on Fair and Juniper Market is like very different than doing wholesale locally with local business partners. Yes, of course, it's about making money somewhat, but it's also just about brand awareness and getting the word out about our company that we exist in Ames beyond our little pocket on the 100 block of Main Street. So, okay. Oh yeah, so another big thing about in-person retail is you have some opportunities you don't have online. So community events are huge things. Getting to do stuff like Art Walk, that is a huge night for us. We sell a ton of nitro tea, especially if it's a really nice warm day. Um, and it's a great way that like we just collectively as a business community bring a ton of people downtown, support, support local artists, but also support each other's. Summer tends to be a little slower and it's a great time to get a little boost by collectively working together. And more so than we could if I was just hosting an individual artist on my own, it really becomes about like everybody pooling their resources, their, you know, who they, who's paying attention to what they're doing, getting the word out. Like we all work really hard together to bring out a really good crowd for the whole downtown community, not just the businesses, but also the artists involved in that event. And it also is just fun. Like as a community member, like a resident, it's awesome that these things happen in our town. It's so much fun. And that kind of leads to the final thing is like foot traffic. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier that like we're technically what's considered an anchor store, which means people will drive. I think this blows my mind and I'm like so honored, but I've actually had people tell me that they've driven from out of state to visit our shop. Like they've driven from Nebraska or down from Minnesota to come to our shop, which sounds really far, but it's like two it's like two hours is usually it. And so people will come up, they'll drive to Ames for the day, they'll come visit our store, they'll place an order, they'll walk around and then they'll pick their order up. They, we can only package 20 something herbs so fast. And every once in a while we have to be like, this is more than we could do right now, but we will ship it to you for free because you hit the minimum for free shipping, which is $50. Anyway, so like, and that's really great. And the thing is too, is like when they come to our store, they then walk around downtown and they visit other stores. And so an example, so like Dog Eared Books is another anchor store or like um, the Quilting Connection is another anchor store. So places that aren't necessarily anchor stores would be like places that are more like general boutiques, um, gift shop kind of places or like a lot of apparel, clothing kind of places. Um, they tend to be more like they'll benefit from people going to the quilting connection specifically and then walking across the street to get like a, a coffee or a lunch from say like Cafe Diem or something like that. So like, or us, we benefit from people going to the quilting connection or dog your books and then being like, oh, there's a tea shop across the street. I'm going to walk over there. So there's cross pollination both ways. And so like the more of those anchor stores you can have where people are driving from far away to come see you, and then shopping around is the perfect mix for like a small, like a small business district. I mean, that's kind of the strength of malls. And you'll hear this language with a mall where you have your anchor stores. So say like Apple would be an anchor store in a mall. And that's really benefiting all those little shops next to it. Like even places like Orange Julius, you may not, I mean, I guess if you love Orange Julius, I do have, oops, 
I do have very nostalgic feelings for them <laughs> from when I was a teenager, ball walking and whatever. But uh, you're not necessarily going to go to the mall specifically for that. But you're going to go there to, say, do your back to school clothing shopping or your go get your computer repaired. And while you're waiting for your computer to get repaired, you're going to be walking around <laughs> getting an orange slushie. <laughs> Yeah, I went there, whatever. It's fine. Anyway, so those are kind of like the five big differences that I have found over the last six years that are the differences between my e-commerce and my physical brick and mortar store. It's most easy for me to talk about this in terms of Littlewoods because I would say it's like the most well-established business that I have right now. Craft Leftovers is definitely the longest running business I've had, but it's gone on hiatus from time to time. And it's been, it's more of a casual project at this point. Littlewoods is more like the full-time job thing. And I feel like there's a lot of really good lessons that I've learned there. So that's why I'm using it as the example. I feel like a lot of these things are applicable to like, if you have a gallery shop, if you've got, well, like I mentioned the quilting connection, you know, that kind of thing. Now, here's the interesting thing is I'm already at like two hours and 56 minutes. I'm like, I'm gonna talk about this fast. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about this fast so that way I could just spend some time mending and whatever. But it, it's kind of a really, it's, it's hard to synthesize and each one of these is so much. And I was like, even when I was writing this out, you can see my notes, uh, I, I was thinking, man, I really should have focused like one of these topics for each live stream over the next six months. Um, so what I was thinking about doing is I think I'm actually going to make this into a guide and a little bit of like, and take it a little further because even as I'm talking about this now, and as I was writing this out, there was so much more that I could have said about this topic and really talked more about the not just the differences, but the pros and cons, and also the challenges of when these two businesses come together in one, which I feel like Littlewoods is a really great case for. Oh my goodness, excuse me. Okay, so just to recap, five key differences between retail and e-commerce. The fast, <laughs> the abbreviated version. One, is merchandising versus online listings. So that's your physical, the way you arrange your product physically in your physical store versus creating online listings on your web store and how you're arranging your menu items. Different mindsets, different skill sets. Two, front window display versus your homepage and your landing page. Both are gonna help customers identify what type of store you are, create a sense of trust, and invite them in to actually buy things. Three is your staffing. When you're online and you're e-commerce, unless there's an order, you don't necessarily have to be working. Physical, you have to have set hours. It is so important, but that means that you have to physically be there even if you're not getting orders. The pro of this is that it creates natural downtime and really creates a sense of structure and differentiation between your work hours and your home hours to create a better work-life balance. Unless you just live at your store. Don't do that. I do that sometimes. Okay, four. Customer demographics, in-person versus online. In-person, they want it now. If you don't have it right then and there, you're not gonna sell it and you're not gonna sell it later because they need it right now and that's why they're coming to you. They're willing to pay a little bit more for that impulse, instant gratification, and it's very experience-based. They want to have a good experience in your store. Personalized shopping, great, environment, welcoming, etc. so important. They also tend to be a little older 
Um, and, oh, and one of the pros is you can, you can personalize their shopping experience. So you can offer like in the food industry, you can offer them samples to entice them to buy things they wouldn't normally try like online. They don't know what it's going to taste like. It's a little, it's a little intimidating. It's a little bit of a risk. If you can get them to try it first and they love it, it's easy. It's an easy decision for them. So you can kind of overcome some of those barriers to purchasing. Online, they tend to be overall a little bit younger and they're looking more, they're doing more comparative shopping. Um, they're looking for something really special or like a taste of home. We get a lot of alumni uh, from Iowa State University that, sh that shop from far away on our online store because they miss us from when they were in college, which is awesome. Go Cyclones. <laughs> And you've got to get them to purchase before you can offer them a sample of something new to try. So that's a little harder. Um, and then number five is your community. Online, your community tends to be your industry partners, your cross promotion, um, your co-branding with other businesses or your brand advocates like your brand ambassadors so to speak social media mentions and maybe doing like guest posts and other kind of things like that both people on your website as well as you on other people's websites and when I say guest post I don't necessarily mean like blog it could be that could, it could take a lot of different formats where in person your community is your neighbors it's your morning chats running into folks on at lunch break um and, and your wholesale and like how that is different where like your wholesale clientele tends to be more just about getting people to come experience your full shop so you're just offering them a little tidbit to try to entice them get them to know that you exist and you have this power to do like these big community events in person that can draw a lot of people and make a big impact, not just for you, but for all the businesses involved in your area. And that you have like anchor stores and these kind of more like spillover traffic or accidental kind of traffic stores and really taking advantage of that foot traffic in both situations. Um, okay, so that was the short condensed version <laughs> of my entire meandering conversation today. Oh my goodness. So, you know, honestly, I put, how are they similar? So this is like, I guess the, the bonus round. I'm just going for it. Whatever. We're over time. I don't care. I get to do what I want because this is a live stream. Um, so here's the thing. Here's the six ways how having an online store and a brick and mortar store are similar. You can't do either without your community. Work life, so that's number one. Number two, work life boundaries are hard to maintain. But that's because you're passionate about what you do. So it's perfectly natural because you love it. It's in your nature just by default that you're owning a small biz, that you're going to have a hard time with work life boundary. Saving, number three, is that saving money by not paying yourself for your time is a trap. It is easy to get into and hard to get out of. Avoid it from the beginning. Please try. I know it's hard. Um, number four, setting expectations of what people will find in your store via your landing page or your front window. Very similar kind of thing. Five is you need some clear calls to action. And six, you need to get to know your demographic. Get to know your people. And, and get to know your community, right? So like bring it back down to that. So, okay. So those are the five ways that um, having a, a brick or a click store are different. But also the six ways that they are similar. Okay, so with that, I got zero mending done, done today, and that is all right. Next time, I think I'm going to talk about the struggles of having a hybrid business. And we'll just, we'll talk about that. Um, I'm going to be doing a little research into that because there's actually some problems I'm working on that I want to solve. 
And so hopefully I'll come to you with some solutions. We'll see how it goes. So I'm gonna grab my notes because I always forget my outro and what I'm supposed to be saying. Yeah, so that's it for today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a review or a comment and check out the show notes, which I'll be posting by next week or so I'll be posting those sometimes next week for all the different things that I mentioned, um, especially all those local businesses that I gave shout outs to, <laughs> as well as some of the resources. And don't forget to sign up for my newsletter. So that way you'll get reminders of when the next live streams come in and also for when new patterns and articles are available um, on the Craft Leftovers website. I'm actually really excited that I'll be having a new zine coming out soon. Um, and I might even have a bonus episode where I take you through it. It's about, <laughs> it's a zine about how to make a zine. Uh, I love it. Okay. 